If you take, for example, in Colombia, we don't operate in the field. We, we don't have people in the field. We're only based in New York because we depend on all of this network. You know, the UNDP, UNICEF, UNFP, WHO, UNHCR, OCHA. They are part of the network, which I chair, which the secretary is my office. And so we look at the broader issue. They work on those issues. They implement action. We actually, it's an advocacy, political voice and advocacy. And so if you take, for example, in Colombia, when we went there, the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights has 100 human rights staff. So they look at all the issue, the human rights issue related, whether it's execution, torture, and all other things. Our own mandate is very specific. And as I said, the reason why the Security Council actually came with this mandate is from Resolution 1320. They did a study, and they, uh, they, re they realized the impacts of armed conflict on women that armed conflict affects women disproportionately than men. And therefore, to be able to address that issue, it became an issue of international peace and security, which demands a peace and security response. That's the reason why they came to that conclusion. And so they are looking at that. And to be able to do that, you have to be able to know the problem. Even today, as I speak to you, we do not know the extent. I give you an example. In Mogadishu, you must have had a problem we have with Somalia. In my report that is going to come out very soon, between January to November, we documented 1,700 women who had been sexually abused in and around the camps in Mogadishu. In Mogadishu. We don't know the number of women who have been abused out of Mogadishu. We don't know the number of women who have been sexually abused in the Al-Shabaab area because we don't have access to it. And we don't even have guarantee that the 1,700 is the real figure. Maybe it's a tip of the iceberg. Because if you take the way the government has responded to the one woman who spoke to the media, yeah. not only has she been arrested, this is the first time in the history of this job we're doing that a victim is being criminalized for speaking out. So you, do you know how many women will be so afraid, apart from the fact that the state is criminalizing them, but the stigma that is with it to say that you are raped? So if we sit down and look at all those scenarios, it's a possibility the figure is five, six times over. So as a result of that, that's what the Security Council is saying. If you want women who constitute about 50% of the population, that human resource capacity is so huge. If you take their lives away from them, as the, the victim in Bosnia said, you dehumanize them, you degrade them, you, you humiliate them to a level where they cannot stand up and do anything with their life. The effect, economic effect in the country, nobody has done a study on that. We need to anticipate that. So those are some of the challenges that we face. You know, and that's the problem we're dealing with. And, and with regards now to the issue of uh, the, the men and the prevention, it's um, the issue of sexual violence against men, like a lot of other issues, is one of the things we want to know more about. We do not have very specific information and detail. I think a lot of the men are very reluctant. I was saying to somebody, I was talking this, this morning to people here, and I said, in the case of Syria, they are using it to extract information from men when they are in prison in detention centers because they want them to talk. In the case of Mali, we sent a team who went to Mali, and we found out that when the two coup took place in Mali, the Red Brigade were supporting the ousted government. The Green Brigade are supporting the now military government. And the Red Brigade attempted to make an attempted coup, and of course they failed. The Green Brigade, when they ran after the Red Brigade, actually forced the Red Brigade to rape each other. And then, in turn, the Green Beret started raping the wives and children and daughters of the Red Beret. These are things which you find very difficult for men to talk about. One or two of the people mm. we sent somebody to talk about, they just broke down. They can't deal with it. The UN response has been sexual violence against women. How can you send a man to a gynecologist? Most of the agencies who are providing the services to deal with victims, are uh, people who have been trained psychologically, physically, to deal with women. 
Most of them are women. How do you deal with it? So it's coming out, we're looking at that discussion, including the issue of how do you deal with children coming out of rape? If a woman is being raped by five, 10 men, then she discovered a month later she's pregnant, how, what is she going to tell that child who is the father? And nobody has been able to document the number of children that are coming out of rape, and mm. what happened to those children, what their life is, just as, with, again, with Syria, we're, we're recognizing that rape triggers refugees. We do not have any information on that, but we see that when we talk to the women refugees, who are the only ones we have access to now in Syria, a lot of them said once they started raping, the men decided to run away with their children and their wives. The issue of uh, uh, extractive industry, how it affects the sexual violence, because when there is war, a lot of people concentrate on the areas where you have the resources in Eastern Congo. You know, so all the armed groups are assembled in Eastern Congo. What's the effect on that? We're seeing a massive number of rape cases in Eastern Congo than a lot of other countries. Is it that because we have so many? So these are all the things. So the issue of rape is that the, it's coming on the mainstream, but we still need a lot more information to be able to understand the context and exact. So these are some of the challenges. Each country is different and unique. It depends what actions they take. And this is the reason why we're, we're engaging research institutions and, and universities and people to help us understand it. This is one of the, the, one of the priority is how we understand rape, recognize and understand rape as a tactic of war. Each operation is different, each country is different. So the response you prepare in the country is different. But at the totality is that we're against rape. One woman being raped in CAR, in Somalia, in Southern Sudan, in Darfur, it's as good as any other number of women. We don't want a single woman to be raped in conflict. We want a scenario where people can recognize women are valuable material in their country. And they are part and parcel of the rebuilding of their country. So when there is war, they should be recognized as stakeholders instead of victims and should not be punished because they are women. Or should not be punished or their bodies become battlefield when the men start fighting for resources or power. So the best way you can humiliate your opponents, you can degrade him, is to go after his women and children to destroy the next generation or the people who produce the next generation. And that way, you can be able to take over the life of those your opponents. That's what is happening because of the, the structure of the battles now. It's within countries. So you go after the assets, the best assets for opponents. How do I destroy? His, his asset base to be able to make sure he, he does not recover. And I punish him in a way he will always remember that I'm the boss. And that's the challenge we face. So that's what we're fighting for, to be able to make sure that we deal with it. So the, as I said, the worst scenario, Somalia is small. It's not as big as DRC. But then what they're doing is as bad, if not even worse than what is happening in the DRC.